Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Good evening, brothers and sisters in Christ, and thank you for spending some time with us tonight as we take some time in God's Word, as we take a little time in prayer. And tonight, of course, is Saturday, which means that tonight's devotion is entitled Saturday in the Spirit. And this is perhaps always a somewhat good name for our time together in God's Word and in prayer on Saturday evenings, but tonight maybe it's just a little bit more apt, because tonight we are actually kicking off a four-part series on spiritual warfare. So tonight and for the next uh, three Saturdays in our Saturday in the Spirit devotion, we will be doing a, a series, as it were, on spiritual warfare, what it is, what it means for the Christian, and how God speaks to this through his word and what we should probably know about these things. Now, I'll admit, <clears throat> this can be an uncomfortable topic, even for, uh, for followers of Jesus, even with as much as the scriptures speak to the devil and speak to uh, the powers and principalities against which we war, as, what scri as scripture puts it. But it is something that we should and need to, as faithful followers of Jesus, be aware of. So let's go ahead and dig in. And we're going to start tonight's study by looking to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. So there it is, right there. Directly, Scripture is speaking about the devil, about spiritual forces that besiege us, against spiritual powers in this present darkness that exist in the heavenly places, as Scripture describes it. And even though it's right there in black and white in front of us, we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we get a little bit uncomfortable sometimes talking about these things, at least here in the West. It's almost like we, we, we sense that in the West where so many people look so much to science and reason and the, the, the post-enlightenment way of thinking, and none of these things are wrong or bad. In fact, they are blessings. But we get uncomfortable talking about things like spiritual warfare. We get uncomfortable and maybe a little embarrassed talking about the devil. We sometimes almost feel like we're being too Christian, as it were, and we don't want to be marked or set aside because we say, yes, the devil is real, and yes, he is active in this world. But he is real. He is active, as are the other spiritual forces that act against us. And with this said, though, there is one thing that I would like to point out before we go any further. We should look to what scripture says about the devil. We should look to what it says about spiritual warfare. We should be cognizant of the fact that these things are real, but we also need to maintain, for lack of a better word, some balance in how we view the devil and spiritual warfare. As C.S. Lewis put it, you can give the devil too much or too little attention. And what he meant by this <clears throat> was if we give the devil too much attention, well, we wind up becoming fixated on the devil. We wind up thinking, well, everything bad that happens, I can blame the devil for that. We stop looking to our own sin. We stop taking responsibility for our own actions. And at the same time, instead of our hearts and our minds being focused on Christ Jesus, on his cross and his empty tomb, instead, we wind up thinking all the time about the devil, and this is not a healthy thing. On the other hand, it's very easy to give not enough attention to the devil, to think, well, you know, that's kind of uncomfortable, especially in Western society today, and, you know, I get along fine, I don't really need to think about the devil and so forth, but when we don't 
acknowledge the existence of the devil and the fact that he and all of the spiritual forces that in their pride have arrayed themselves against God and therefore against those who follow Jesus, we open ourselves up to attack because we, we create our own blind spot and the devil loves this and takes advantage of it. And let's have no doubt here. It's not just Paul in his letters and some of the other letters that we find in the Bible. It's not just in the Old Testament that we find reference to the devil and so forth and writings about the devil. Jesus himself speaks of the devil. He speaks of the devil. He casts out demons. He himself was tempted in the desert after he had spent 40 days without food or water. The devil came to him and tempted him. So you could say that we have it on the highest authority that not only is the devil real, not only is the devil active, but that he is going after us. Jesus himself is is example of this and he speaks to this. So then, <clears throat> what does this mean to have the devil and, and the spiritual powers in high heavenly places in this present darkness attacking us? What, in other words, does spiritual warfare look like? Well, first of all, we need to be careful when we're talking about these things that we not confuse our own sin and our own condition of sin with spiritual warfare. Because the fact of the matter is most of the evil that we experience comes from sin. It comes from the fact that we are fallen and broken human beings. It comes from the fact that because Adam and Eve sinned, because they themselves succumbed to the temptations of the devil, that we ourselves have inherited this condition of sin and it is by our own nature that most of what we do in fact everything that we do without God's grace has an element of sin in it it's just our fate in this in this fallen and broken world and we have to take ownership and responsibility for that sin and we certainly can't blame that on the devil but with that said there is also active evil in creation the devil is active, he prowls about like a roaring lion, as scripture puts it, and he targets Christians. He goes after Christians in particular. You know, maybe he's not so worried about those who don't pay any mind to Jesus and, and God and so forth because they've already, they've already, he's already accomplished his ends with them. But with Christians in particular, he is going to attack, and we need to be aware of his attacks. <coughs> Excuse me. So who is the devil and what does he want? Well, a lot of times when we start talking about the devil, a lot of people will start thinking about a Walt Disney devil or a Looney Tunes devil. You know, maybe a guy in some sort of red tights and uh, with uh, horns and a pitchfork, maybe sitting on your shoulder, maybe with kind of a, a goatee kind of look. And in the West, we've almost made a caricature of the devil and who he is, but that in no way is the way that scripture describes the devil. If we think about it, the devil was has many names, and one of those names is Lucifer. The devil is he who was cast down from heaven by God because he because of Lucifer's pride, because Lucifer, who was the brightest and the greatest of all angels, dared to look in pride at God's throne. And God said, nope, not having it. And he threw him down from heaven. And he went from being the brightest of all the angels to the darkest of all of the fallen angels. Another name for the devil is Satan. Satan, who shows up in the Garden of Eden as the snake, who tempts Adam and Eve, who gets them to enter into this condition of sin that we ourselves today are a victim of, that we suffer because of. The devil is he who came to Jesus Christ himself, the little son of God, in the desert after 40 days and tempted him. The devil is not some cartoon. He is not some caricature. He is very real. He is active evil in this world. And what does he want? Well, I think Luther summed it up the best. With regards to Christians and truly anyone, all the cunning of the devil is exercised in trying to tear us away from the word. Again, the devil's purpose, as Luther states it, is all of the cunning of the devil is exercised in trying to tear us away from the word. 
The devil doesn't care about anything else. The devil has been separated from God through his pride. And in the end, that is the thing that he wants more than anything else. He wants to tear us away from the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And there's no perfect time for the devil to do this because the devil, as cunning as he is, as strong as he is, as wily as he is, he can attack no matter where we are. If we're strong, the devil is going to attack us through our pride. If we're weak, the devil is going to say, well, obviously you're not good enough for, for, for God to love you. If we're in periods of joy, the devil is going to go after us and say, well, obviously you did this on your own. What do you need God for? And if we're sorrowing, if we're in a place of suffering, the devil is going to come to us and he's going to say, well, again, you know, obviously you've done something and God doesn't love you very much. The devil lies. The devil is deceitful and the devil will do anything he can to tear us away from the word. Now, sometimes, of course, that's doing nothing. For those who do not look to God's word, for those who say, nah, I don't, I don't need this Jesus stuff. Well, the devil doesn't really have anything else much to do other than simply to, to, to continue to, to encourage people in those behaviors. Sometimes the best thing that the devil can do to keep us from the word is nothing at all. And the devil, he is good at the long game and he is more than happy to do exactly that. But I think... I think what the devil hates more than anything else is when we are doing God's work. Now, I'm not just talking about doing ministry. I'm not just talking about serving in the church. I'm not just talking about going out and do actively loving our neighbor, whether in whatever sort of service or, or aid that might be. I'm talking about things as simple as reading the word. I'm talking about things as simple as praying. I'm talking about things as simple as forgiving our neighbor for those little things that just kind of get under our skin. The devil hates it when we are doing God's work. The devil hates it when we look to Jesus Christ. The devil hates it when we make the word our guide in our lives. The devil hates it when we put our faith in God through Jesus Christ. And he paints a target on our back when we do these things. No matter how little the service may seem to us or how great the service may seem, it is still service to God and the devil, he hates it and he will paint a target on our back and he will, one way or another, attack. But God, <clears throat> God doesn't leave us there. God is faithful and God loves us and God protects us. And Paul writes about what that protection is looks like. So let's return for a moment to the scriptures and, and see this metaphor that Paul paints of how it is that God protects his people. He writes, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. So Paul paints this metaphor of God's uh, protection of us, that God lovingly through his grace gives us, as being kind of like the armor of a Roman soldier. See, the Romans in Paul's days they were kind of the elite soldiers anywhere in the world at the time, and their armor was really high quality, as was their, their weapons. And Paul says, look, when you are protected by God, it's kind of like being a, a, a Roman soldier in his armor, and that's pretty tough stuff. But here's the thing. Well, Paul does call upon us to put on this armor. If we think about what the armor is, Really, it's all a gift. It's not so much about us doing. It's about God protecting us and us simply looking to that protection. And in fact, when we look at the metaphor of this Roman armor and this Roman gear that Paul uses, it's almost all defensive. I mean, think about it. He speaks of the belt of truth, right? The belt that would go around the soldier's waist and hold everything together. But the belt of truth, truth is something that comes to us from God. We're not responsible for truth. All truth, in the end, comes from he who made the universe. And the breastplate of righteousness, we as Christians know full well 
that we are not self that we are not righteous in and of ourselves in fact self-righteousness is a sin our righteousness instead comes from God it is a gift of God similarly Paul writes of the shoes being like the gospel of peace as he continues his metaphor but we don't create the gospel of peace that is given to us we cannot give ourselves the peace that passes human understanding that comes to us through the Word of God that is completely a gift of grace the shield of faith that Paul writes of that protects us from the darts the flaming darts as Paul puts it of the attacks of the devil faith too that is absolutely a gift of God given to us by his grace and the helmet of salvation we are not responsible for our own salvation if we were we would be in an awful lot of trouble no our salvation comes to us through Christ Jesus through his life through his death upon the cross and through his resurrection from the empty tomb and everything that Paul has talked about here if you'll notice it is all defensive there's no offensive gear listed in in what Paul writes here yet everything protects us and every and all of that protection comes from God it comes to us through God's grace as a gift and in fact the only offensive bit in this entire set that Paul is talking about is the sword of spirit that is the Word of God that is the only way that we are given in all of these things to attack the devil and how is it that we are told to use the sword of the spirit we are told all the way through Scripture that the gospel is intended to save that the gospel is to be used with love we're not supposed to go out and beat people with it but rather it is using God's Word the way he intends his word to be used that we are given even as it is a gift of grace but we are given to drive the devil away through simple things like reading the scripture simple things like prayer simple things like simply living out our lives as God calls us to and as we do so God gifts us with all of these things that protects us and most importantly he gives us our word that certainly not only drives the devil away but through which we come to know God we come to know Jesus we come to know the truths and the realities that God has made manifest for us and in the end most importantly we better come to know Jesus Christ who lived for us who died for us and who rose for us Brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us this evening. Now, next week, we're going to continue with this Saturday in the Spirit series on spiritual warfare. Um, next week, we're going to be looking a little bit more at how it is that the devil can kind of get under our skin, kind of tries to get to us, and what, how we can be aware of this, and what we can do with God's grace to be protected from these things. But until then, Remember that you are God's beloved children, that he protects you, that he watches over you, that he gives you the gifts that protect you from evil. So brothers and sisters, stay in the word, stay in prayer, stay vigilant, but always remember that you are God's beloved children, that Jesus loves you, that your family of faith loves you, and that I love you. Brothers and sisters, will you join me in prayer? <clears throat> Lord God, we give you thanks for this time that we have been given to spend together. We give you thanks for the grace and the mercy and the love that you pour out upon us. We give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived for us, died for us, and rose for us. And we ask, Lord, as your Son taught us to pray, that you do protect us from evil, that you protect us from the evil one. But Lord, even as we bring this petition before you, we give you thanks that it is by your grace, by your love, that we are protected. We ask, therefore, Lord, that you always keep our eyes and our hearts and our minds upon you, upon your Son, upon his cross, and upon the empty tomb. We pray these things in the beloved name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, have a wonderful evening. I hope to join you in worship tomorrow morning. Until then, the peace of the Lord be with you, always.